Hi, and welcome to another episode of Recover Loud. I'm your host, Mike Paddleford, and I recover loud. Today's episode features Angela Crabtree from Down East Maine. Her story of trauma and resilience has brought her to the light of recovery. I'm grateful to sit down with her today and hear how she's giving back to her community. sitting here with Angela Crabtree from Down East Maine. Angela, thanks for coming and sharing your story with us. Thanks for having me, Mike. Um, everybody's experience is valuable and important, and uh, to have you come here to share yours is, is much appreciated. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what it was like growing up in your household? What, what did that look like for you? Um, well, I am a twin, and my twin brother died um, when we were two and a half and for a long time I thought that I killed him because he fell down the stairs and I I pushed him we were playing uh, and that messed me up for a really long time um, and my parents were absent um, grew up in a home with alcoholics and addicts you know yeah. so from the very start you didn't really have good coping skills um, or uh, you know, the good role models. Um, to, to deal with that, that must have been very traumatic. Um, two and a half is an early age, but it's still, I mean, you're old enough to know what's going on and, and have those memories. So, um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure that was awful. Um, so how did, how did you deal with that? Well, I just became a completely different child. Um, you know, we, we did grow up with another family. Um, my mom got clean after my brother died. Um, and we, we moved around, we moved around a lot. Um, and then I, I just, I went through a lot of um, abuse from my sister. I was beat every single day, just yeah. kind of tortured. Um, and I started cutting at nine years old. Wow. It, it wasn't a healthy coping mechanism, but you got some relief from that. Yeah, it was like, you know, I, I wasn't doing it to like kill myself, but it just, it helped release that emotional pain. Like, mm -hmm. it was the only way that I knew because I, I had nobody to talk to. I yeah. thought there was something wrong with me and I just couldn't figure it out. I couldn't understand why nobody wanted me and why nobody wanted to help me. Now, at, at that early age, I mean, did you realize that you needed somebody to talk to? Did you, were you open with your parents? Did you ask for help? Um, it was, I want to say the third grade, my teacher actually told my mom I needed counseling mm -hmm. um, because I was drawing pictures of a casket at the bottom of stairs um, with me standing next to it. Yeah. Yeah, so that memory stuck with you and, and haunted you. For um, a long time. At what point did you turn to substances? I was 14. Um, so at 14, you know, I, 
I did what most most kids do in down east Maine, you know. Um, I thought it would be cool to smoke and drink and I wanted to fit in. I so desperately just wanted to fit in because I moved there so I didn't grow up there and uh, I didn't know anybody and I didn't fit in. I, I, I was different and um, so that's what I did. And it was the only way for me to like kind of fit in and it was way better than cutting. A lot of times when I hear people's stories, I, I, I almost understand the reasoning for, for choosing to escape. Um, you know, I had my own reasons uh, growing up, obviously, to, uh, to want to escape. Um, but that's a lot for a, a child your age to handle. And, you know, when we're not shown how to deal with those things and, and not, not helped the way that, because we don't know what help we need, you know? We're too young to understand that. And when, when our parents aren't there to provide that, so um, I understand the need and uh, I mean obviously you weren't going out to become an addict and you know to become an alcoholic and and to destroy the rest of your life you know you were just choosing to to get away from it in, in the moment um, so how bad did it get for you after high school um, I, I joined the carnival okay and uh, you know, I was a carny and did that for a little bit. Um, and I moved to Lewiston. And from the age of 19 to 21, I tried to commit suicide uh, nine times. I was blue papered nine times um, from overdosing on purpose. Um, that was also when I found my drug of choice and I completely fell in love. Yeah. I, it was like I found my best friend mm. um, and I got into a little bit of legal trouble and then um, came back home in 2004, found out that I had hepatitis C, was devastated. Mm. Um, I didn't really know anything about it back then. Everybody was like, oh. Um, and we know today that, you know, there is a cure. Um, a lot of friends that I have have, have gone through the treatments. Um, did you have that opportunity? Yeah, so I, unfortunately, I got pregnant first. So I had to wait a whole year before starting um, the treatment. And I did the old treatment. So I was on interferon and ribivirin and I was on it for six months and then I ended up in the hospital because my spleen didn't necessarily rupture but I was bleeding internally and they wow. thought I was going to die um, and my daughter was about six months old when that happened hmm. and um, I remember going to my doctors and begging him no you have to keep me on it you said a year it was going to be more effective after a year and uh, he looked right at me and told me, no, you're going to die. We need to stop. He's like, you're, you're virus free. And I've been virus free ever since. As substance users, you know, we're susceptible to a lot of different diseases. Um, just the lifestyle we, we live, um, you know, and an overdose isn't the only way that someone dies um, with the d disease of substance use disorder. Um, so knowing that that treatment's there and it worked for you, um, you know, I, I'm happy for you. And for other people out there who may have Hep C, you know, um, there is a cure. You know, there there is a treatment, and um, I'm just grateful um, that my friends have been able to to get that, and, and glad to see that it worked for you. What was it that that made you decide to get well and to recovery? Well, when I came home, and after going through the treatment with the Hep C, um, I had my daughter. And then I went to cosmetology school, um, and then I got married in 2006. And I just, I wanted something different. Um, and I, I was fighting with the fact of whether or not I was really an addict at the time, mm. because I was like, well, I, I don't want to use, and I don't really have to use, because I wasn't around it anymore, okay. you know? And, um, then I got divorced in 2010, um, met somebody else, 
started drinking all the time with him. Uh. It was a very abusive, abusive relationship. Um, and then started doing drugs again. Yeah. Yeah, we have to be vigilant in recovery, you know. Um, just not wanting to use sometimes isn't enough. Um, because, you know, our sick brains can, can bring us back to, to using and, and, you know, choosing to drink can lead to other things. Um, you know, and, and that's what happened for you. So how long did that last? So in 2013 um, was when I really relapsed. I was assaulted by the guy that I was seeing. Um, I relapsed. That was the year that I also met another guy, um, was in a gang, um, was transporting drugs, got caught, spent some time in federal prison. Ah. First time I'd ever really, really been in trouble. Mm. Um, and that was like a hard pill to swallow. I had to joke about it in order to kind of get through it. Mm. And, uh, you know, I spent three years away from my daughter. And, um, and then I came home in 2017 and I stayed clean for a little bit, became the manager of KFC within like three months of working there. Um, and I stayed that way for like a year and a half, something like that. Mm. Um, and I met my son's father. And you went back out again. So yeah, um, I got pregnant um, with my son's father. Um, and then he ended up going back to prison. They raided our apartment. Um, he went back to prison. My son was born August 10th of 2018. Um, his dad came home August of 2019. And September 1st, he had been home for like four days. First time he's met his son. And um, I had gone to the hospital that morning. I should say, like, we decided that, you know, we were going to use one last time, you know, mm -hmm. we were going to stop together because I had tried stopping before he came home. Yeah. And I couldn't figure out why, why I couldn't stop, you know? Um, but we were like, okay, this is the last time. Mm -hmm. We'll do it together. Um, so September 1st, 2019, um, I came home from the hospital around noon time and I walked into my apartment and I found him dead in our apartment and like my first thought was are you effing kidding me right now wow. because we still had drugs in the house I was on federal probation um, I stepped over him like I already knew that he was gone and uh, so I stepped over him because I wanted to get high before I called 911 and I needed to get rid of everything. So again, a, another huge traumatic experience for you. Being somebody that once was dependent on substances to deal with life, I can understand why you would need to use in that moment. Um, so how did that turn around? How did you get out of it finally? Um, I, I had to send my son away for like five days because I couldn't even take care of myself. I knew I wasn't going to be able to take care of my son. Um, CPS still took my son um, from me. Um, but after five days, I walked into my very first 12-step meeting. And I started with IOP. I got individual substance abuse counseling, mm. mental health counseling, and I just knew that, that something needed to change. IOP is an uh, intensive outpatient program. Um, so did that work? Yes, I actually, um, I actually asked to be in it a little bit longer um, than normal. Uh, I was still on federal probation, and I will say, like, my POs never gave up on me. Uh, they were like surrogate parents. Um, I wanted to give up so many times, and, and they just, they didn't give up. They didn't give up on me. I got a new job. Um, I got a new apartment. 
I walked to work in the freezing rain two miles both ways. Like, I did what I needed to do. And you got to do that. I did. Um, eight months into, so I have one more slip, um, one more relapse. So my clean date is December 15th of 2019. And that's when I really had that aha moment of like what the disease is and how it really works. Um, because before I wasn't quite sure, I still was playing with the idea of whether or not, you know, I still kind of wanted that excuse of whether or not I could use. Right. Um, but then finally, you know, I, I had that moment and then eight months later I was buying my first home. And how did that feel? Uh, words can't even describe mm. it. Eight, you know, I had the keys to my house and I got my son back right before buying that house. So my son was there. Um, I got to paint his bedroom whatever color he wanted. I painted my bathroom pink <laughs> just because I could, right. you know, and then I bought a brand new car and, and now I just, I do other, I mean, it's just been great since being in recovery. Um, you know, I'm a member of BARC, which is the Bangor Area Recovery Community Coalition. Nice. And um, their focus is on um, community education and resources, you know. Mm. And then I'm also a member of the Maine Moms Advocacy Program. What our goals are, you know, is to provide advocacy for families affected by substance use disorder, um, to address gaps in services and basic needs for families affected by substance use disorder, and to increase awareness and provide education across the state system and the community. And one of the things that I do is set up presentations um, with whether it be federal probation or um, Pankless, so my son goes to Head Start, mm -hmm. um, and bring main moms there, and we do a presentation about what main moms is, because it's a resource. Yeah. And that's what I like to do. Um, so I do a lot of community outreach on my own. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, so after all the trauma that you went through and the struggles that you had with your own mental health and substance use, why are you choosing to help others now? I think like it is so important because if I hadn't had this chance and, and I hadn't understood um, what the disease was, I would have died alone out there. And, and it's so important, you know, I think education is the key. Mm -hmm. um, we know what the issue is now. We know that it's the disease. We know what the disease is. It's not about just treating the, the symptoms anymore. Right. And, you know, using substances is a symptom of a bigger problem. Right. And focusing on, you know, the trauma that we went through, um, you know, recovering loud, you know, talking about it. When we stay silent, we don't deal with it. We can't heal with it uh, or from it. So, you know, we, we sit in silence, we suffer in silence. When we recover and we recover loud, we're helping others while we're helping ourselves. Um, so I, I've known you a, a few weeks now and, um, you know, just seeing and hearing your story and seeing where you are today, um, you know, I feel blessed to know you um, because so many instances you could have been gone, you know, and then the life that you have today wouldn't be there. You know, your children wouldn't have their mother. Maine moms wouldn't have an advocate. Um, the recovery community would be missing an important member. So thank you for uh, deciding to get better and doing what you needed to do. Uh, and I'm happy to support you in all you do and, and appreciate you coming on and, and sharing this with our viewers because this is, these are the important conversations we need to have.
if, if you could take a moment to speak to people who may be struggling <laughs> out there right now, what would, you, what would you tell them? I would say, like, you know, you're not alone. Um, and w never alone, never again. That's one of the things um, that I had to learn. It's really hard to swallow pride sometimes and ask for help, but it's worth it. You know, I, I found something that I was missing for a long time, and it is just an amazing feeling to know that I can show up today for the people that I love and care about, because like, I'm a human being, and so are you. And it's all about like the compassion. Like people don't have a lot of compassion anymore, mm. and and we're all human beings. We all suffer with something. Yeah. You know, um, nobody goes through this life perfectly. Um, nobody goes through this life without help at times. Um, so when we're in the darkness and we feel like nobody cares and nobody loves us, um, there's a community that does, you know, and we're willing to help. We're willing to offer the resources uh, because we've seen what this side of it looks like, you know, and we're not superheroes, um, but we did it. You know, we're here today. We dealt with those traumas and it didn't kill us, you know. I'm gonna love you until you can learn to love yourself. Yeah, yeah, and that's what this is about. Um, and we love others because we know what it's like to not feel that love, not to fit in, um, you know. So uh, I, I'm proud of you today, you know. And, and again, I, I appreciate you coming and, and sharing your story. Thank you again for, for having me here. It, it was such a great honor. Um, mm -hmm to be able to be here and, and share my story with you. And there's so many more great things to, to go on from here. Exactly, recovery's a journey. Don't stop now, keep going, keep climbing. And uh, appreciate you reaching back to help others. Hey guys, my name's T. I'm the director for Recover Loud, and this is T Talk. I'm here with Ashley and Angela, and we're gonna check in for the week. Um, so I'll start. For me, this week I have um, done a lot of outside things. I got invited to join um, a new warming hut opening up in Auburn, and we're trying to figure that out. And I also am going on a show to talk more about recovery and eating disorders involved in recovery. And next week is my recovery coach, so next week I will officially be a recovery coach. Ashley? I'm Ashley. Um, this week I actually reached out and signed up for more courses to further my education um, for recovery coaching. So th I'm looking forward to that. Um, I just want my education to go above and beyond what I already know. So, and that's about what I've done this week. Yes. And I'm Angela, and I am going to be getting ready to do overdose response training um, coming up next week. And I am getting ready to also do um, a state steering meeting. And that's pretty much it for me. Well, guys, thank you for being on. Thank you, my wife, Katie, for being our camera girl. And everyone, recover loud. Have a good night. This week, many of the recovery advocates from across the state were successful in getting the legislature to pass the expansion of the Good Samaritan Law. I want to thank Governor Janet Mills for compromising with us on this bill to help save lives. I want to express my deepest appreciation to Senator Chloe Maxman and Representative Charlotte Warren for their work on this bill. The main recovery advocates worked hard to get this law passed because we understand the importance of saving lives. Thank you for the hard work you've put in. Recover loud, everyone. Much more. 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 Much more.
Every time I call, you pick up the phone, and always reminding me that I'm not alone, and even when I'm scared and my feet are frozen, you help me keep it going like a semicolon. Even if I'm lost, you helping me light the way, and even in the dark, you always keeping me safe. And everything I've lost don't compare to what I've gained, so no matter what it costs, yeah, I'd be willing to pay. Cause every time I call, you pick up the phone, and always reminding me that I'm not alone, and even when I'm scared and my feet are frozen, you help me keep Keep it going like a semicolon So I'ma follow your steps for all of the way I put my faith in you and walk on the waves And if I stumble a bit and fall on my face You come and save me with all of your grace, yeah Thank God